station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We're ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Loud and clear. Station, please stand by for student questions from Challenger Learning Center. Hi, my name is Soita Chidambra Ganesh, and I'm from Cerritos, California. My question for you is, what is the one thing that made you want to be a part of the Demo 2 mission? Hello, Swetha. That's, that's an excellent question. I think for both Doug and I, we were really excited to get a chance to launch again from Florida. We had launched from Florida on space shuttles before, and it had been uh, several years since we'd been able to do that. And so we were just really proud to be able to do that again from America. Hi, my name is Liam Letterman, and I am from Colorado Springs, Colorado. My question is, are you excited or were you scared to launch off into the rocket and go to the International Space Station? Hey, Liam. I was uh, really excited. Both Bob and I were excited to get uh, another chance to fly in space and to fly a different rocket. So we were very much excited to fly the Falcon 9 and the uh, Dragon Endeavor. Hi, my name is Isabella. I was from Ohio. And what's your favorite food to eat in space? Well, hi, Isabella. Fortunately for us, we have lots to choose from, and it seems like we get uh, new samples every now and then as well. So it's difficult to answer that question because there's several things that I like a lot. I recently enjoyed the crab bisque, seafood gumbo, uh, and for dessert, there's different kinds of pudding and cookies. We have lots to pick from. Uh, so I think the, my favorite kind of food to eat is one that I don't have to cook myself, and that's all of it here on the space station. Hi, my name is Aiden Ledbetter, and I'm from Metropolis, Illinois. And my question is, how do you feel being the first astronauts to be launched from a commercial rocket. Station, please key your mic. Both Doug and I were really excited for the chance to launch on the commercial rocket. We had a, a great time working with SpaceX, uh, got a lot of quick innovation, a lot of new things on the spacecraft uh, that we just wouldn't have been able to have if we had taken uh, the regular government route to, to produce the spacecraft. So just we got laptops uh, that we had on space shuttle and we've replaced those all with touchscreens, just some uh, really neat technology on the new uh, new spacecraft. Hello, my name is Nathan Franklin, and I am from Paducah, Kentucky. My question is, was learning to fly the SpaceX rocket completely different than flying the shuttle? And if so, what was the most challenging part? That's a great question. It was a lot different than flying shuttle. The shuttle flew kind of traditionally like airplanes, and so we had controllers that we used to fly the shuttle whenever we took over manually. For Dragon, we had touch screens to fly and uh, very little button pushing. So it was very interesting to fly a different vehicle with a touch screen. Hi, my name's Arabella and I'm from China Spring, Texas. And my question is, how will you make it home safely?
Well, we we uh, rely heavily on a, a team of very smart engineers, technicians, uh, and managers to help ensure that the sa ride home is is safe. And it's a challenging uh, part of the mission, to be honest, to to come back home. In a very simple way of thinking about it, all on launch, all of the bad stuff that can hurt you is behind you. On coming home, all the bad stuff you have to go through. In, and it's in front of you. And, and so to do this, we have a, a heat shield that prevent, prevents us from, uh, from the capsule from overheating. And we, Bob and Doug will have parachutes. Actually, I'll have parachutes in the Soyuz as well. So all three of us will, will be relying on a parachute system. So there's a lot going on on, on coming home. Uh, but the bottom line is there's some really smart, talented people who work very hard to ensure our safety on landing day. My name is McKenna, and I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. My question is, what is the significance of the sequined, cute little stuffed animal I saw on the day of the launch? Well, McKenna, that's a, a great question. The significance of the, the little stuffed animal is that we use it to indicate whether or not there's gravity where we are. And so when you're launching in a spaceship, first the gravity increases as you're pushed back by the rocket. And when you make it to orbit, uh, things start to float. And so we have a little physical indicator to make sure that that uh, can be seen by the, all the folks who are watching us inside the capsule. And this uh, particular one that uh, Doug and I selected was uh, actually chosen by our sons. Uh, they have a extensive dinosaur collection between the two of them, and uh, this one was the one that they settled on. Uh, Tremor, the pink and blue sequin dinosaur, got to make the trip with us into into space. Hi, my name is Ella, and I'm from Burbank, California. My question is, what determines how long you'll stay in the International Space Station since this was not predetermined? That's a great question. Uh, if you find out the answer, please let us know. But it, honestly and seriously, it's uh, there's a lot of factors that go into how long our mission will be. First and foremost is the condition of our, our spacecraft. This is the first flight of Dragon with a crew, so the engineers at SpaceX and at NASA will be taking a good look at that vehicle to make sure it uh, is functioning properly. The next uh, big thing for us is some spacewalks. Bob and Chris are going to get to do some spacewalks that are important to maintaining the uh, electrical system within the space station. So it's an important uh, few spacewalks that we have in front of us. And uh, once we get those done, then that's another thing that we can look towards to figure out how long our mission is going to be. And then finally, the crew that is replacing us. Uh, when their launch date uh, becomes more official, that will also help us determine when we can actually uh, go home. Hi, I'm Samuel Kowal. I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. My question is, how will 3D printing in space help you with future missions such as the mission to the moon in 2024? That's a great question, Samuel. We have uh, a lot of equipment, and equipment can fail at any at any time. And so, therefore, you when you have a lot of equipment, you have to have a lot of spare parts. And in my opinion, that's the the one of the value the 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 most value added and potential value added for the 3D printer is to help us with spare parts. That way, we we can have the. Uh, virtual spare parts in the on the computer files and then print them as needed and I think that would be a game changer because the three of us were dealing with an awful lot of cargo over the last few days and moving bags and things because we were reorganizing our our equipment and uh, much of these uh, bags contain spare parts so so 3d printing is is a really cool capability that that we'll have uh, particularly to enjoy when we go farther into this, into uh, beyond low Earth orbit. Hi, my name is Christopher Coba, and I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. 
And my question is, what was it like to dock the Crew Dragon on the International Space Station? That's a, a really good question. And, and to answer what it's like to dock to the International Space Station, you know, for us, if this, uh, if this ball was the International Space Station and we floated very, very carefully towards the International Space Station and it all lined up perfectly, we would come into contact and stay there. And that's exactly what happened with the Dragon. And it was just so smooth that we couldn't even feel it. Uh, Doug and I were both a little bit surprised, uh, kind of expected a, a little bit more motion being so small in our spacecraft and such a big space station, but uh, it docked very smoothly and we didn't even feel the contact. Hi, Bob and Doug. My name is Brianna Ramirez. I'm a teacher here in San Antonio, Texas. My question for you is, with the successes of SpaceX, what do you see in the future for private citizens who wish to take a commercial space flight? And if possible, how far into the future do you anticipate this could happen? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, tough answer. I think uh, there's going to be more and more opportunities as the years go on, and I think the biggest thing that is going to affect uh, private citizens flying in space is the cost to get things and people to orbit. Right now, it's fairly expensive still, and I think once more companies get involved with low Earth orbit especially, I think you'll see that improve fairly quickly as far as the opportunities for private citizens. I think now, if you're a private citizen, you've got to be extremely wealthy in order to pay for a seat to get uh, into space. But I think that will change. It may take 10, 20, 30 years for that to start to change such that the average citizen can afford to go into space. But uh, I think it will definitely happen. And I think it will make us, it will certainly will make us a better uh, citizen and a better uh, steward of our planet the more people we get to go into space. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. Thank you to all participants from the Challenger Centers. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure audio and video for your downlink message.